Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rule book that federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring this series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with prim primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies, as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifersouse.com. Uh, we will also be hosting a Hot Topics in Government Contracting uh, event this uh, on Tuesday, October 8th, 13th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, please find more information on our website as, along with registration. And let's move on to learn more about today's speaker, Dan Graham. You can find his contact information here. And today we will be covering FAR Part 42 with Dan. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're thankful for your participation and the floor is now yours. Thank you, thank you, and thanks for having me. Um, so it's a, quite a broad topic uh, today, FAR Part 42, Contract Administration and Audit Services. Uh, FAR Part 42 has 17 different subparts, and, and I'm going to try to do a survey of all of them. Uh, but there are a number of subparts here that we could easily spend the entire hour discussing. So we're, we're only going to we're not going to, we'll do more than scratch the surface. We'll, we'll dig a little bit below the surface, but uh, this is a survey of FAR Part 42, and uh, there is quite a bit uh, in here uh, that, that would merit further discussion. And so if you have any questions, uh, if you have questions about specific sections, specific issues that have come up that I don't cover today, uh, please don't hesitate to email me, call me. Uh, happy to answer your questions as best I can. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So let, let's talk about what FAR Part 42 is supposed to do. Uh, the, the, the goal here is to prescribe policies and procedures for assigning and performing contract administration and contract audit services. Uh, there are separate subparts that deal with audit services and separate subparts that deal with administration services. The, the focus is administration. The concept of audit services is in support of uh, administration, and, and FAR Part 42 addresses the coordination of all of those services. Uh, a lot of contractors have multiple contracts with multiple agencies, and FAR Part 42 at the outset uh, encourages the use of interagency agreements to reduce and avoid uh, duplication of contract administration and audit effort. Uh, not That's more of an aspirational goal than uh, a goal that's realized in, uh, in real time, uh, but it is the aspirational goal. And so if you feel like you are being pulled in different direction, uh, certainly, and if you are feel like if you feel like you're being subject to redundant contract administration activities, uh, you can appeal to the, the very beginning of FAR Part 42 to say, look, you need to coordinate on your end government so that I'm not having to answer the same question twice. I'm not having to undergo uh, the same audit, the same review, the same investigation uh, uh, and monitoring twice. There's some duplication, some redundancy that is just inherent and impossible to avoid when you have multiple contracts with multiple contracting officers at multiple agencies, uh, but FAR Part 42 at least does set an aspirational goal that uh, the government should coordinate in the first instance to try to reduce that. 
typically the cognizant federal agency and the, the word cognizant is used uh, throughout part, FAR Part 42 to describe the agency or the agency official that takes the lead. The cognizant federal agency should be the agency with the largest dollar amount of negotiated contracts. The agencies can agree that a different uh, agency or agency official will take the lead. Uh, oftentimes that might happen because even though one agency has a larger dollar value of negotiated contracts, another agency has uh, contracts that involve more complicated co uh, contract administration functions. So an example would be, I've got a client that does healthcare claims processing for the federal government. Uh, they have most of their contracts with the uh, Defense Health Agency. Uh, however, all of that is fixed price. They have fewer contracts in terms of value with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. All of those contracts are cost plus. Those cost plus contracts uh, include a number of contract administration functions that aren't relevant to the fixed price contracts. And so CMS is the cognizant federal agency for that client. Uh, typically, the cognizant agency should stay the cognizant agency for five years to have some uh, continuity. So just because uh, your, your uh, contract values for one agency take uh, overtake the contract values for another agency, uh, cognizant should not switch back and forth from agency to agency. That, that would defeat the purpose of focusing on interagency uh, coordination, avoiding duplicative, redundant, conflicting uh, contract administration and audit, and, and ensuring continuity. Can we have the next slide? So we'll, we'll start with, uh, we'll just go subpart by subpart. Uh, some of these I will discuss very briefly. Uh, some of these, there, there really isn't too much there. Uh, and I'm just going to highlight what I think is important and, and move on to the ones that are a bit more involved. Uh, 42.1 contract audit services sounds very important, but there's not a whole lot here. Uh, if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of uh, audit functions, you really have to dig into the defense contract uh, a audit agency manual uh, and DCMA's guidance and procedures. Uh, but 42.1 does make a very important point that is uh, forgotten on a daily basis throughout the federal government. Auditors are advisors, not deciders. Uh, their role is to ad provide advice to the contracting officer, uh, recommendations to the contracting officer uh, based on their expert uh, expertise in reviewing and understanding financial and accounting records. Um, many times, however, uh, DCAA assumes the role of decider. And uh, the more, as we see private audit firms being used more and more by civilian agencies, uh, more and more frequently now we are seeing auditors act as deciders or behave as if they are deciders. Uh, and frankly, we see, I see, many contracting officers afraid to question the advice and recommendations they get from auditors, whether it's DCAA, whether it's a, um, a private audit firm. Part of that fear, part of that apprehension is uh, a lack of confidence because they don't have that expertise and, and maybe they just don't know how to question uh, the advice and recommendation of an auditor. Uh, but there's also a degree of bullying that's happening out there. So DCAA will actually report uh, on instances where uh, contracting officers don't follow their recommendations, and they will report on that as a government control deficiency. Uh, and no contracting officer wants to be called out for not protecting the taxpayer money as uh, DCA recommended they do. Uh, so you really need, the, the way a contractor responds to that and addresses that is you really have to use your exit conferences, your entrance conferences, your ability to respond to draft audit reports to tell the contracting officer in very plain language with appropriate citations to the FAR cases, other authority, why the auditor is wrong. Because if you can 
if you can give the contracting officer a little bit of confidence that the auditor is in fact wrong, the contracting officer is always the decider. Let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, so far, subpart 42.2 defines contract administration services. Uh, really what's, what's important here is it introduces the concept of the contract administration office and the administrative contracting officer. Uh, so contract, th there, there's a broad type of administration functions that can be delegated to a CAO. Uh, and then the CAO will, a, a CAO is DCMA, for example. Uh, the CAO will then appoint an ACO, uh, who is a warranted contracting officer. Uh, and then the A in front of CO indicates that that is not the procuring contracting officer who awarded and signs uh, the, signed the um, uh, SF33. Uh, they are the contracting officer to whom contract administration, specific contract administration functions have been delegated uh, under FAR Part 42. Uh, it's critical that you know who your CAO and ACO is. Uh, the the uh, procuring contracting officer should notify you uh, when contract administration functions have been delegated. Uh, it should identify not just the CAO, it should also identify the ACO or at a minimum, you should get a, a, a notice from the ACO very quickly, I'm sorry, from the CAO very quickly who the ACO is, uh, but also the specific functions delegated should be uh, given to you and, and should be very clear. You should never be in a position where you're uncertain who, whether the PCO has responsibility for that or whether the ACO has responsibility for that. And, and you just have to remember always the black letter rule uh, that the contractor assumes the risk that it is following direction from a government official that does not have authority to issue that direction. Uh, and so if you get a direction from an ACO and that's not, and it relates to a function that hasn't been delegated to the ACO, you're assuming the risk that you cannot reasonably follow that direction and that the PCO uh, will second guess your action and say, well, I don't care the ACO told you to do it. I, that, that the ACO didn't have authority. So if you don't know what's been delegated to your ACO, ask. And certainly if you don't know who, if there's been a delegation to an ACO, ask that. And if you don't know who your ACO is, ask that. Next slide, please. So 42.3 actually gets into the functions that can, and in some cases should be delegated. And there are 71 different contract administration functions uh, listed in 42.302, uh, I think it is. Uh, and they span the, the spectrum. You've got your kind of quintessential contract administration functions that deal with cost and pricing issues, uh, but it, there's also re review of insurance plans, review of compensation plans, uh, complicated technical uh, per performance evaluation matters, uh, other contract administration functions that deal with uh, past performance uh, or um, financial responsibility. It really is quite a broad list. There is a, a substantial amount of contract administration that does not need to be performed by the PCO, that can be performed by an ACO, uh, and that contracting officers should consider whether it would be more effective uh, to, to have that function performed by an ACO. Uh, with, with a few exceptions, the FAR doesn't require uh, designation of an ACO and delegation of functions to an ACO. It just instructs the PCO to consider whether that would be more efficient. Uh, and in some instances, that may be something you might want to recommend. You might have a PCO under one contract uh, who is performing contract administration functions that an ACO is performing under five other contracts, and it would be much more efficient to have that ACO perform uh, those functions under all six contracts. And you, you are certainly uh, free to make that recommendation to the PCO on the one contract. And even if it's in a different agency, uh, make that recommendation and suggest that the agencies get together 
uh, and try to avoid duplicating their, their effort. Um, there's four functions that are always delegated to an ACO unless the PCO is also designated as an ACO. So uh, just to not to try and throw too many acronyms at you, but just imagine a contractor that has a dozen different contracts. Um, it's entirely possible that the PCO on one of those contracts is designated as an ACO. Uh, but uh, there are four functions that always have to be delegated uh, to an ACO, have to be consolidated uh, in one contracting officer. Uh, negotiation of forward pricing rates, establishment of final indirect cost rates and billing rates uh, to the extent that you meet the requirement for CO determination of final indirect cost rates. We're going to talk about that when we get to subpart 42.7. CAS compliance, review of CAS disclosure statements, and determinations of adequacy and compliance uh, for an accounting system. Uh, these are always delegated because they are always um, they always uh, pertain to more than one contract. They, they pertain to the entire business unit segment uh, and sometimes the entire company. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, 42.4 and 42.5, uh, nothing terribly important or, or earth shattering there. 42.4 just tells uh, the PCOs and the ACOs to uh, coordinate when it comes to uh, corresponding with the contractor and to coordinate when it comes to uh, visiting uh, the contractor's facility. So if a, a contract has been uh, delegated uh, administrative contract administration functions to an ACO. Um, the ACO needs to know when the PCO and the PCO staff are popping by for a visit, uh, and the ACO and the PCOs need to make sure that they are each aware of and have in their files copies of all relevant communications with the other contracting officer. Uh, 42.5 deals with post-award orientation. It's, it's really targeted. It's not limited to small businesses and new contractors, but it's focused on small businesses and new contractors and just encourages that agencies at the outset of any contract uh, with a, a small business or a new contractor have some sort of orientation, whether it's a um, a kickoff meeting, uh, some sort of conference, or, or even just a letter that tries to um, set level set expectations. Presumably the contractor understands expectations or at least understands the expectations uh, that are set out in the statement of work or PWS that uh, the contractor just bid on and was awarded a contract for. Uh, but 42.5 says it can't hurt to have a meeting after contract award to just go over that stuff and you know review the highlights. Uh, 42.5 encourages agencies to consider when a post award orientation might be helpful for uh, companies that aren't small businesses or uh, new contractors. And I this is something that I tend not to get terribly involved in in my practice, but my my sense is that post award orientations are are pretty ubiquitous um, post-award kickoff meetings and conferences. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the CACO, the Corporate Administrative Contracting Officer, this is the subject of uh, 42.6. Uh, this is, it comes into play when you have contractors that have multiple operational locations, each with a resident ACO. So, uh, Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon, Lidos, uh, the, the big ones, um, they have multiple uh, locations, multiple facilities. They have administrative contracting officers that are uh, at least 75%, if not more, of their time is, invo is involves contract administration functions for that uh, operational location or business unit. Uh, those entities need a corporate ACO, corporate level ACO, who will focus on determination of final indirect cost rates, uh, corporate wide, uh, ho corporate home office expense allocations, compliance with CAS 403, uh, and corporate accounting practices. Next slide. 
Okay, we'll we'll go a little bit more slowly here because this this is where the meat of FAR Part 42 uh, really starts. Um, one of the basic administrative and most complicated administrative uh, contract administration functions uh, that is almost that is required to be delegated to an ACO is the establishment of billing rates and the well the settlement of final indirect cost rates and, and oftentimes the establishment of billing rates uh, however billing rates can be uh, set by the pco uh, it's they're not required to be delegated to an aco but they often are and it makes sense that they often are because <clears throat> the process of setting billing rates is is very similar or involves the process of reviewing final indirect cost rates uh, so for just for those of you who don't deal with flexibly priced contracts, I, I assume most of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about final indirect cost rates and billing rates, but let's just review that. Um, billing rates are uh, rates that are used temporarily, provisionally, they're often called provisional billing rates, to uh, reimburse the contractor pending the uh, res finalization uh, and negotiation of final indirect cost rates. So on a, a cost plus contract, uh, six months after the end of the contract year, the contractor submits an incurred cost proposal uh, and then that's audited uh, and the rates are, are negotiated and, and finalized. The billing rates are the rates that are used to provide for reimbursement uh, in the interim. Uh, they're to be adjusted, they're to be based on uh, recent uh, indirect rate performance. Uh, so that the billing rate should essentially look like uh, recent rates, but they, they are estimates of what the rates for a given year will actually be. So they, they can deviate from the estimate, uh, but the, the contractor in its provisional billing rate proposal will explain and justify any deviation from historical rates, particularly the most uh, recent historical rates. Uh, billing rates can and should be adjusted to avoid substantial overpayment and underpayment. Uh, and that's particularly important uh, given the, the length of time that it takes to finalize indirect cost rates this year, these year, the, excuse me, the length of time it takes to finalize indirect cost rates these days. Uh, DCAA, other audit uh, entities have gotten better uh, at providing more timely audits of incurred cost proposals, uh, but it's still a multi-year process. Uh, and uh, there are lots of things that can happen over the course of time uh, that would cause uh, a contractor to realize that its actual indirect rates are going to be substantially different uh, from its proposed billing rates uh, and the billing rates should be adjusted so that they provide the best uh, the best available prediction of, of actual cost rates. Now, th there's a, a trade-off here. Uh, you, you don't adjust your billing rates every time you have some reason to think that your uh, some reason to believe that your actual rates are going to be slightly different. Uh, there, you don't you only adjust billing rates when it's really worthwhile, when there's going to be a substantial overpayment or underpayment. Uh, but you shouldn't hesitate to ask for an adjustment of your billing rates uh, if there if you expect a substantial underpayment and explain why. Uh, and you should also not hesitate to inform your customer when you have a reasonable basis to expect that your billing rates are going to result in a substantial uh, overpayment. Um, agencies uh, will assess accounting system deficiencies and estimating system deficiencies if they see that um, uh, contractors are not timely notifying them of known uh, overbillings uh, or, or, or known situations where their billing rates uh, are substantially higher than a revised estimate. Let's go on to the next slide. 
Final indirect cost rates are uh, what I said a moment ago. These are the rates that are <coughs> audited or negotiated and agreed to uh, after the submission and audit of an incurred cost proposal. FAR 42.7 provides that a single agency shall be responsible for establishing final indirect cost rates for each business unit. Uh, and those rates shall be binding on all agencies and their contracting offices. Uh, so this is an area where the FAR says about three or four different times, we only want one contracting officer uh, negotiating and establishing indirect cost rates for a contractor, for a contractor's business unit or segment. Uh, and it says it again here. Uh, Incurred cost proposals, um, that's actually not a term that's used in the FAR, uh, but it's a term that's widely used in government contracting. The FAR refers to them as final indirect cost rate proposals. Uh, but whenever I say final indirect cost rate proposal, I mean incurred cost proposal and vice versa. They are certified. Uh, failure to certify uh, an incurred cost proposal allows the contracting officer to unilaterally determine final rates. And of course, a false certification uh, on a, an incurred cost proposal uh, potentially creates liability under the Federal False Claims Act. Uh, as we all know, the Federal False Claims Act provides for uh, treble damages and fines and penalties uh, for statements that are knowingly false. It doesn't require that uh, statements be intentionally false or made with intent to deceive the government. Uh, it only requires that the, the contractor should have known better uh, before it uh, made a particular certification or statement. Let's go to the next slide, please. The, uh, there is a statute that provides in addition to the liability under the False Claims Act, uh, separate penalties for the submission of unallowable costs uh, in a final indirect cost rate proposal, in an incurred cost proposal. And there's basically two levels of penalties. Uh, the first level of penalty is one times the amount of the unallowable costs uh, plus interest on any amount of unallowable cost actually paid by the government. Uh, so there, there's kind of two things here. You submit an incurred cost proposal and you itemize all the costs that are, you list all the costs that are included in your G&A pool. Uh, if you uh, include in that G&A pool, costs that are expressly unallowable, you know, lobbying costs, alcohol costs, all the other sorts of things that are listed in FAR 312051 is expressly unallowable. Um, the amount that's listed in that incurred cost proposal is, uh, the penalty is one times that amount. To the extent that that amount was used in any way to calculate billing rates, to estimate billing rates, uh, to the extent that uh, those costs were included in an invoice and in a change proposal or something like that, uh, then the government's also entitled, in addition to the penalty of one times the amount of the cost, interest on the amount paid. And it's actually interest at a higher rate than the Prompt Payment Act interest uh, rate. Um, the other penalty, well, before I move to the, the second level penalty, it, the penalty only applies to expressly unallowable costs. And there's been a substantial amount of litigation uh, and dispute over the years as to what is an expressly unallowable cost. We know what an unallowable cost is. An unallowable cost is any cost that's made unallowable by FAR Part 31 uh, or by the contract. Uh, but expressly unallowable costs is a subset of those unallowable costs. Uh, for a long time, contractors tried to argue that uh, an expressly unallowable cost was a cost that was listed as, quote, expressly unallowable. Uh, and there are a number of cost principles that say this cost, you know, a, a particular category of cost is expressly unallowable. Uh, the Federal Circuit in 2019 issued a decision that 
uh, took a more a broader uh, uh, approach. And so an expressly unallowable cost um, is a particular item or type of cost which under the express provisions of an applicable law, regulation, or contract is specifically named and stated to be unallowable. It doesn't have to use, <clears throat> and that's the FAR definition, the Federal Circuit's interpretation of that definition was, it doesn't have to use the word expressly uh, and it doesn't, it, 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 the FAR can say that one uh, cost, item of cost, uh, is specifically named and stated to be unallowable, and other items of cost that of are the same, that are of the same type as that item of cost would also then be considered expressly unallowable. And the case where that came up with was a case where uh, a company had um, uh, in-house government affairs staff. Uh, and as you all know, the, the federal cost principles make lobbying costs unallowable. Uh, lobbying costs, the lobbying cost principle doesn't expressly state that in-house government affairs staff are uh, unallowable. That was considered to be uh, similar, a, an item that is that was of the type of the lobbying costs that are uh, expressly unallowable, and the contractor in that case was therefore properly assigned uh, uh, the first level penalty um, under the statute in FAR Part 42.7. Uh, the second level penalty uh, comes into play when there is a prior determination that a cost is unallowable. And, and it's not limited to expressly unallowable costs. The second level penalty comes into play when you're told this is unallowable by the government, uh, perhaps in a audit from a prior uh, fiscal year, uh, perhaps in an audit related to a modification or a change order on another contract. Uh, but you um, included it again in another incurred cost proposal or another uh, uh, price proposal. Uh, then you're subject to two times the amount of the cost that was included plus interest. The penalties uh, can be imposed regardless of whether the government ever pays the cost. So this is why it's such a big deal with incurred cost submissions. Uh, sometimes the incurred cost emissions seek costs that were never paid, uh, but inclusion of an expressly unallowable or uh, other unallowable costs could subject you to penalties nonetheless, but interest only runs on the amount actually paid. Can we have the next slide, please? Final indirect cost rates uh, can be determined through a couple of processes. So there are uh, what are called uh, contracting officer, there's the contracting officer determination procedure, and there is the auditor determination procedure, uh, and then there's the quick closeout procedure. The auditor determination procedure is something of a misnomer. The contracting officer always determines the rate uh, if there is a disagreement. Uh, the auditor determination pr procedure, uh, what that really means is the auditor will take the lead and conduct the negotiation, uh, And but if there is a dispute, if there is a disagreement by the contracting, uh, by the contractor with the auditor's uh, determination of what the final indirect rate should be, then the contracting officer comes in and makes the final determination. Quick closeout is a process that is available for contracts orders that are physically complete and the amount of unsettled direct and indirect costs uh, are less than a million or 10%, whichever is less. Uh, so that's a very narrow exception because the, the dollar, A, it only comes into play when the contract is physically complete uh, but B, those dollar thresholds um, are very small. Now, it's the, the dollar threshold is, is uh, calculated based on the unsettled amounts. Uh, so if you have actually settled amounts for prior years and you only have one year that's unsettled, uh, e even though um, the, the 
there's it's a very large contract it's possible that one year or part of a year that's not settled might uh, be less than uh, 1 million but again that 1 million or 10 percent it's whichever is less so a lot of a lot of clients uh, come to me and say oh it's less than 10 percent of a hundred billion dollar contract um, unfortunately it's 1 million or 10 percent whichever is less and 1 million is, is pretty low next slide please Um, once cost rates, final indirect cost rates are settled for uh, the last year uh, of a physically complete contract, so once all years have been settled and negotiated, that the rates for uh, those contracts have been settled and negotiated, uh, then the contractor within 120 days is to submit a completion voucher. Um, the, the contractor should have been providing uh, vouchers, updated vouchers, as final indirect cost rates have been negotiated uh, on an annual basis um, or as they've been negotiated, even if it's a, a semi-annual or, or a longer, less frequent basis. Uh, but there is a 120-day clock to submit that final completion voucher. And if the contractor doesn't submit it, the contracting officer can unilaterally uh, determine the and settle the contract. Um, the and finally, the government can and often does impose ceilings on final indirect cost rates uh, in contracts. This is something that seems to go in and out of vogue uh, every few years. Um, a contracting officer gets burned on an indirect cost rate that spikes in one year and then decides to impose a three or five percent ceiling and uh, that in indirect rates for all contracts in the following year, then realize that that's a real pain to administer and then removes the ceilings in, in the following year. Uh, but it is available. The FAR, uh, FAR 42707 talks about using ceilings for new contractors, contractors that are getting their first flexibly priced contract and don't really have uh, an established history of cost performance, of indirect cost uh, accumulation, um, or it can be used in a situation similar to the example I just described, when there's a recent history of very substantial fluctuations. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of similar to the, it's, it's, try, it's a different way to address the same problem that billing rates are trying to address. The whole point of billing rates is to come up with something that the contractor can use to invoice with that is going to be, you know, representative and as accurate as can be, uh, as accurate a prediction as can be made of what the final indirect cost rates are going to be. Uh, final indirect cost rate ceilings are a measure that protects the government from a situation where the contractor really just doesn't know what it's doing, doesn't have enough data to provide reasonably accurate uh, billing rates. And so the con it protects the government from a situation where the final rate might be you know, many, many percentage points higher than the billing rate. Next slide, please. 42A addresses disallowance of costs. Um, pretty straightforward process. Uh, there, there's a process in 42A for issuing notices of intent to disallow costs. That's more of a prospective notice uh, that, that goes out before the cost is incurred. Uh, and then there's a separate process for disallowing costs already incurred. A lot of overlap here between the disputes process in the Contract Disputes Act and the disputes clause. Um, disallowances, the 42A provides that disallowances involving indirect costs need to be coordinated with the contracting officer or auditor responsible for establishing final indirect cost rates. Um, one issue that comes up uh, whenever the government disallows a cost or provides a notice of a disallowance is when can the contractor appeal that? Uh, when can the contractor take that to the Board of Contract Appeals or the Court of Federal Claims? Uh, there are a number of decisions that say that uh, uh, from the boards in the court that say that a decision by the government 
disallowing costs is immediately appealable as a government claim. So if the government says we're disallowing this cost, the contractor then does not need to file a certified claim under the Contract Disputes Act for those costs. The government has asserted its own claim disallowing those costs and that government and issued a final decision on its own, on the government's claim. And that final decision by the government on the government's claim is immediately appealable. When you read FAR 42.8, however, it would lead you to believe that you have to respond to the notice of intent to disallow cost. You have to respond to the disallowance itself and tell the government why the government's wrong. Uh, there is certainly a process in 42.8 to do that. If you want to do that, if you feel like you can uh, turn the government around, uh, but the, the law is that in many instances, uh, those disallowance decisions are immediately appealable and it's not a defense. The government can't say, well, you didn't go through the process in 42A. Uh, the government would then have to answer that appeal at the Board of Contract Appeals or the Court of Federal Claims. Next slide, please. Apologize for the background noise there. Um, 42.9 addresses bankruptcy, uh, doesn't say much, just says, it tells contracting officers to get a lawyer when they find out that a, a contractor has declared bankruptcy. Uh, there is a clause, there's really not much the procuring agency can do. Uh, there's a clause that requires notice of a bankruptcy. Uh, and really the focus of 42.9 is tell the government attorney who's involved in the bankruptcy whether you have any claims against the contractor that need to be uh, addressed and resolved in, in the bankruptcy, allow the, law, the government to assess whether uh, there are any claims that would be exempt from discharge in bankruptcy. Uh, and also, does the, does the contractor have any government property that needs to be carved out and removed from the uh, um, debtor's estate in bankruptcy. Next slide, please. Uh, 4210 it doesn't exist anymore, or it exists, but it's been reserved. 4211 it, it talks about production surveillance. It's really just performance monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of fancy words and uh terms here like criticality designators um those criticality criticality designators don't really come up come into play except for a, a small number of uh contracts um basically what 4211 says is uh conduct production surveillance uh, determine contractor progress identify factors that may delay in, in performance uh review plans and schedules but don't um, go overboard, limit your uh, production surveillance to that information essential to government needs uh, and take maximum advantage of data output generated by contractor management systems. So a very similar uh, issue that comes up in the context of uh, inspections. Um, don't conduct overly intrusive inspections that uh, impair or uh, impede the contractor's ability to do its job, but do what you need to do. And the, the definition of an overly intrusive production surveillance is similar to the, the definition of an overly intrusive investigation. Uh, it is a, a, an investigation or I'm sorry, inspection uh, that uh, acquires more information, attempts to acquire more information than is reasonably necessary uh, for the contracting agency to ascertain that the contract is being performed properly. The next slide, please. 4212 involves novation, change of name agreements. Uh, novation is the fancy FAR term uh, for an assignment. Uh, so if you are transferring the contract from one legal entity to another legal entity that is an assignment of the contract 
it can only be accomplished through the novation process in FAR part, subpart 4212. Uh, the reason for that is there is um, a, well, we'll get to the Anti-Assignment Act in a moment. Uh, um, 42, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about change in name agreements other than to say, uh, 4212 discussion of change of name agreements doesn't really talk about trade names, DBAs, uh, but oftentimes it comes up in the context of trade names and DBAs. Uh, so you need to look at 4212 and 411 if you are using a trade name to do business and uh, particularly if you are thinking of changing a trade name uh, under which you currently do business. Uh, novations and change of name agreements are usually executed by uh, the ACO if the contract's been assigned to an ACO. Uh, and if there's a, a, a CACO, then it's, the novation and change of name agreement is handled by that CACO. Uh, otherwise, uh, the novation change of name agreement is handled by the contracting officer with the largest unsettled balance of contracts. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So we'll talk more about novations now. So that what drives this requirement for a novation is a statute, a very, very old statute called the Anti-Assignment Act. It basically says that any attempt to assign a federal government contract automatically voids the contract. Uh, and over the more than century that that statute has been on the books, uh, it's been interpreted to, to say you can't assign a government contract without the government's consent. Uh, novation is the process by which the government consents to a uh, novation. So when we think about how this comes up in transactions involving contractors, uh, we, we, we think about mergers, we think about uh, acquisitions. Acquisitions can happen in a couple of different ways. Uh, an acquisition can occur when the, the stock of the contractor is purchased by a different entity. Uh, so there's a change of control. That's not an assignment. Uh, that may create all sorts of issues in terms of uh, conflicts of interest, uh, whatnot but organizational conflicts of interest, but it's not a, an assignment. A stock purchase is usually not an assignment that triggers a requirement for a novation. Uh, instead, it's really an asset purchase uh, where you are buying all or substantially all of the assets of the contractor. The contractor, a third party is, is purchasing that and wants those assets as well as the contracts transferred uh, to the name of the, the purchaser. Uh, those agreements will require uh, a novation in order for the contracts to transfer. Mergers are, are a little tricky. Um, here you have a situation where there is a contractor, ABC Corp, that's being merged into XYZ Corp. Um, the cases interpreting the Anti-Assignment Act would say that that is not an assignment, uh, that the contracts aren't being transferred into the name of uh, XYZ Corp. Instead, XYZ Corp, uh, or if that's happening, it's happening by operation of law because ABC Corp is ceasing to exist and becoming uh, XYZ Corp. The way the FAR is written, it doesn't make that distinction. And the FAR, if you just read the FAR and ignored those cases, it, it would clearly say that an ovation is required when there's that kind of a merger. Whenever I'm involved in a merger, I just, I say that the Anti-Assignment Act isn't implicated. I say an ovation isn't required, but I say we'll, we'll sign whatever you want us to sign in order to recognize the uh, following entity as uh, the successor and in interest of the uh, merged entity uh, and we'll give you all the information that FAR 42.12 requires and my experience has been that's always been the path of least resistance to accomplishing the business objective of a merger. Um, it's important to remember that the government 
contracting officer is not required to novate anything and that the government will conduct an assessment of whether uh, recognizing the assignment, approving the assignment is in the government's best interest. Oftentimes it is, oftentimes these deals are happening because there, there's some planned efficiency uh, that will provide the value uh, or economy to the government. Uh, but the government is entitled to make up its own mind. The government's also entitled to look to the uh, acquirers, the transferors, uh, record of ethics, integrity, uh, their financial capability uh, in order to uh, determine whether a novation would create a substantial amount of risk. And, and the FAR talks about recognizing or novating contracts when there has been uh, a sale of all of the transferees' uh, assets. Uh, I'm sorry, the transfer, I've got transferee and transferor mixed up here. Um, the FAR is written as in terms of requiring uh, evidence of a sale of all of the transferor's assets or substantially all of the assets that are used in contract performance. And it, it, it doesn't mean that the government can't novate a contract when that hasn't occurred, uh, but it, it certainly requires some explaining and communication in order to explain why the government should do that. The, the default expectation when uh, the, the government receives a request for a novation is that there is going to be evidence of a sale of either all of the assets, uh, the, the entire company has essentially been purchased, or all the assets, substantially all of the assets used in performance are being transferred. Uh, so we've moved on to the next slide here. Um, there's a no previous slide, please. Well, I apologize for that. My audio oh. cut out for the last few seconds. So, oh, sorry. Um, so, 42.1204 has a template novation agreement. Uh, most contracting officers like to do things by the book. Uh, you edit that template novation agreement uh, at your peril. Um, I've edited it before many more times than not. I've been told to just use the uh, template agreement, uh, but there are times when deviation from the template is appropriate. And certainly the contracting officer can uh, include additional language provisions that the contracting officer thinks uh, are necessary. And since the CO has to hold the ultimate discretion whether to approve the novation or not, uh, sometimes you have to agree to that. Uh, 42.1204, uh, requires the, a lot of documents uh, to be provided. Uh, but what's re what really stands out and creates a, a chicken and the egg dilemma uh, is that one of the items in 42.1204 is evidence that the transfer of assets has been completed. Uh, so, and you actually have to provide opinion of counsel that that's been uh, completed and effectuated under uh, governing law. Uh, which which really is problematic because you are transferring the assets and you have to effectuate the transfer of assets before the contract can the the underlying contracts can be assigned. Uh, and so the way you address that is in that asset purchase agreement, you provide for some sort of provisional temporary agreement where the Purchaser, purchaser who now has all the assets but not the contracts will perform under a subcontract pending novation of the uh, contracts to the purchaser. Uh, but it, it, you can't say in that agreement how long it's going to take because there is no time period uh, that the government has to act within. Uh, next slide, please. So suspension of works, I'm gonna speed up now. We only have a few more minutes. Uh, suspension of work, stop work orders and delays, government delays. Uh, suspensions uh, is a term of art. It is only used in constructions and architect engineer contracts. Uh, on those contracts, the government can suspend for a reasonable time. Uh, the contractor is not entitled to any uh, price adjustment, <clears throat> although it is entitled to a, additional time for the amount of the suspension, 
uh, if the suspension lasts for an unreasonable amount of time, uh, then the contractor is entitled to a price adjustment. Let's go to the next slide. Stop works, uh, stop work orders are similar to suspensions. They're issued on non-government, non-AE contracts. Uh, they allow the government to stop work for a period of time that's necessary for the government to determine whether the contract should be deter determinated, um, whether for convenience or cause. Uh, the stop work can only be for 90 days unless the parties agree to a longer period. Uh, the stop work can be full or partial, just like a termination can be full or partial, um, but the uh, stop work shouldn't be used in place of a termination if the government has already uh, made the decision to terminate. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, one other point on stop work. So the contractor is entitled to an equitable adjustment uh, for any cost impact caused by the stop work. Government delays are delays caused by the government as the, the term would suggest. Uh, government delays uh, are different from excusable delays. Uh, typically, an excusable delay only allows you additional time, not money. Uh, it is a, an affirmative defense to a termination for default, uh, but not a basis for which you can ask uh, for additional uh, uh, compensation. If the delay is caused by the government, then the contractor is entitled to both additional time and money. Next slide, please. Uh, 4215 is reserved, uh, 4214 is reserved, 4215 deals with uh, contractor performance information. Um, it establishes uh, the CPARS uh, system, the contractor performance assessment reporting system as the official source for past performance information. It provides uh, instructions to contracting officials on how to input past performance data into CPARS and also how to review past performance information in CPARS when in awarding new contracts. Next slide, please. Um, 4215 requires agencies to prepare past performance evaluations at least annually and also at completion. Uh, there are five factors that have to be considered in any past performance evaluation, technical, cost control, schedule, management, and small business subcontracting. On that fifth factor, the past performance evaluation has to consider uh, the contractor's performance against small business subcontracting plans uh, and whether the contractor is making reduced uh, or untimely payments to small business subs. So this provides a, a, a leverage point for small business subcontractors that don't feel that they're getting the opportunities that they may have been promised in a teaming agreement or a subcontract, or that they're being uh, nickel and dimed in their invoices. Uh, you can report them to uh, the contracting office who will, be, who will have to consider that in a past performance evaluation probably not going to do a whole heck of a lot for your relationship with that prime, but it, it's a leverage point, a lever that's there to pull if you like it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's a process set forth for obtaining the contractor's uh, viewpoint and comments on a past performance evaluation. Uh, it's a very short amount of time, 14 days, that the contractor has to be given. Uh, the, the notice of the evaluation comes through CPARS and the contractor has to respond through CPARS uh, and then the agency will make a final decision. But if there's a disagreement about the evaluation, that disagreement has to be resolved at a level above the uh, contracting officer. Uh, past performance information in CPARS is source selection uh, information. It's not public. However, there is information that is public, and that's on the next slide if we could go to it. So this is the information that goes into the FAPIS model module of CPARS, and this includes um, defective cost or pricing data determinations, uh, terminations for default, trafficking violations, 
uh, and three or more unjustified reduced or untimely payments to small business subcontractors under a single contract within a 12-month period. Uh, when these determinations are made by the cognizant government official, they need, need to be added into the FAPIS module within three calendar days. And at th after three calendar days, or once they are added, uh, they are public. So if you are subject to one of these determinations, uh, be very aware that that becomes public as soon as it's entered into FAPIS, which is supposed to happen three calendar days after the fact. Um, so uh, your competitors will know about that, and maybe filing bid protests against your awards. Uh, just be, be aware of that. Next slide, please. Small Business uh, Contract Administration, uh, this is, it provides a, an aspirational goal that CEOs must make every reasonable effort to respond in writing within 30 days to any written request to the CEO from a small business concern with respect to a contract, you know, admit, a contract administration matter. Uh, very, very broad, something that you can point to when you feel like you're not being given uh, the attention you deserve if you are a small business concern, uh, but it's every reasonable effort. It's not a mandatory 30-day response requirement. Uh, it doesn't apply to claims under the Contract Disputes Act, uh, and it allows the contracting officer, if it can't respond within 30 days, to provide, uh, to identify the date within which it will respond. Next slide, please. Uh, last but not least, for pricing rate agreements, um, really only applicable to a small uh, number of contractors uh, having a significant volume of government contract proposal proposals. The, the threshold right now is $200 million uh, at DOD. Um, the Cognizant ACO for the uh, contractor, the, the business unit segment will determine uh, whether an FPRA will be established and uh, that will, if so, the contractor has submit a, submit a forward pricing rate proposal. It then gets negotiated like any other contract action. The contractor has to provide certified cost or pricing data. So there's an effective pricing risk uh, associated with the negotiation and execution of an FPRA. Uh, but once it's uh, established, the rates in that FPRA uh, are used to price contracts and contract modifications uh, for whatever period of time the agreement specifies. So that's, we're two minutes over. Those are all my slides. Um, we're not taking questions, I understand, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have by email or telephone. I look forward to hearing from you and, and thanks to everyone for attending and thanks to uh, Jennifer Schoss for having me. Thank you for a great presentation, Dan, and to our audience members, thank you again for participating with us. If you have questions about this part, please contact our speaker with the contact information seen on your screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.